It's been a bit, but we are back with another episode of Show and Tell, and I'm really excited to share this one with you. I sat down with my friend Nathan Smith, who is a movement and holistic health coach, and this dude has been a huge inspiration for me since he's come into my life about two years ago. We dive into a bunch of stuff, the benefits and challenges of running a one-man business, how to find common ground with people you may disagree with. Nate shares his story of overcoming addiction and substance abuse. We also dive into some practical ways on how to build up one's confidence. We share some perspectives on primal movement and the fitness industry as a whole, along with some tips on how to build your fitness practice and your lifestyle. There's a lot of other great stuff in there and I encourage you to listen to this thing from start to finish. It's an amazing conversation. So let's jump into the Nathan Smith interview. All right, well, welcome back to Show & Tell. Uh, we are here with my buddy Nate. And um, yeah, Nate is a just a great example of a human to me. And we don't know what we're gonna get into, but I know it's gonna be super valuable. Mm -hmm. Nate and I met at a uh, Lane 8 concert mm -hmm. at Red Rocks. And uh, I did something that I wanted to do for a very long time. Lane 8, he, uh, it was one of those concerts where they give you the sleeve that magnetically locks so you can't have your phone out during the show, which was really cool. And uh, Nate and I connected before the show, and he came over to me later and was like, hey, I don't know how to get in touch with you, but I want to make sure mm -hmm. that uh, we connect mm -hmm. uh, in the future. Uh, really enjoy spending time with you. And I reached into my fanny pack and I pulled out, I mean, it's not this one, but I pulled out a hacky sack, which had my contact info on it mm -hmm. and I gave it to Nate. And yep. uh, so that was a, a special moment for me, a special moment for us and, and a start of a friendship. But uh, yeah, we were able to get in touch with our, uh, each other from uh, probably the coolest business card out there. So yeah, Nate, um, what is the question I want to ask you here? <laughs> <laughs> How do you spend your days? Like what, mm. what do you like putting your energy towards? What do you like building in your life? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, lately I've been spending my days balancing coaching and community. So networking with a lot of rad people, you and I, every time we talk, have a great conversation. Um, so kind of day in the life, like I've been trying to get up early, get like a, like a solid movement session in. And then I usually schedule anywhere from two to four clients, probably about four or five days a week. And then, you know, sometimes that'll change and spread out, but the, the flexibility is nice for me. And I will say the, the downside to that flexibility is finding the motivation to keep the momentum up. Mm -hmm. and to make sure I'm staying in that rhythm. Um, right now, kind of the goal is filming a lot of videos and getting a platform, online platform set up. And I actually have a call uh, with this guy, Doug, from Playbook to maybe build out a program on Playbook. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's kind of like what my week's been like this week, trying to build that stuff. And I probably have, when I, I really sat down to think about it and kind of wrote some stuff out, and I think I have like, probably 500 videos I have to film, which I know you have a huge library of stuff. And it's like, I was like, should I do this alphabetically and just have like <laughs> everything? So that, that seems daunting. Just it's like easy on one hand. Cause they're like anywhere from like a 10 second clip to like a two minute video. Yeah. But then it's just like the volume of it mm -hmm. and organizing it and then making sure that organization goes appropriately to like different programs and different clients and stuff like that. So I know the online stuff for me, which is like the focus of my day to day, has the highest leverage, but getting it going seems to be the hardest part. So it's like I've been balancing the in-person stuff with trying to execute the online stuff. There's like the momentum of the grind. Yeah. And it yeah, does yeah. burn you out mm -hmm. when you're going really hard with it, but there is this momentum that, yeah. you, you know, this sprint where you have a goal that you're working towards. So when you do start to be able to have that uh, work-life balance or mm -hmm. you do have more freedom with your schedule um, especially with the online platforms and whatnot as you build that stuff out um, the scalability is there your time starts to free up and then if you don't really have anything to replace it with mm -hmm. then uh, you can lose that momentum or um, 
it's maybe you start uh, spending your time in less optimal ways. Yeah. Um, and I, I've definitely struggled with that as well. Um, and so I think one thing that has stood out to me when it comes to any sort of work is uh, prioritizing some sense of a sprint. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be uh, something that you, um, you know, are always doing or always mm -hmm. in, but working towards something where, let's say the program I'm working on right now, Primal 45, I was working on the concepts of this mm -hmm. for probably the last six to 12 months. You could even say like the past five years if yeah. you really wanted to, yeah. right? Um, but the the actual filming of it and the style of the videos and how I wanted to approach things from the queuing standpoint and the instructional standpoint and then the organization of it, I really need to be in that work from the moment I wake up mm. to the moment I close my computer and I'm, I'm done with it yeah. because I, I want to really connect with that work. And so I think there's a lot of value in that, but at the same time, you do that all the time, you get in this yeah. cycle of burning yourself out. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a new, a new flame has been sparked in me. So in 2018, our buddy Matt and myself, uh, we opened MoveNet Denver, which was a natural movement gym. And that's the last time I remember like sprinting really, really hard mm -hmm. because, you know, we execute a full business plan. We, we leverage the funds from other people to invest and open this facility. We get it going. We have a grand opening of all these people and we're like, wow, we fucking did it, you know? And then 2019, we're doing our best to stay afloat. Rent is something I never want to deal with again in a brick and mortar. <laughs> and then, you know, first year as a brand new business is hard for anybody regardless of the time period. But then that first year led to 2020. And then in 2020, you know, my dad passes, which is a whole separate topic. But with that grief, March comes around, lockdown, we can't see clients anymore, we close the gym. And so I end up feeling just like the flame extinguished. And I, in, a, in a way I was happy about it, I was like, oh, like time to move on to a different campsite, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I was like And so I, I just like, I lost the momentum though for a few years and I started just kind of falling back on what I knew, which was like coaching and I was working at a ski shop and, um, I just didn't have the drive up until earlier this year, earlier this year, I was really motivated, started to get things off the ground and I broke my leg. And then that breaking of my leg, let me sit in reflection for nine weeks, basically. Um, wasn't really able to do as much obviously as I wanted to do. And so that time and reflection was like a point for me to like go inward and understand that like, oh, I need to spark this fire again. And so it was a process of, for me of like first kind of designing a master class. And so I wrote out this document that's like, like, how do I train? How do I like to move? What's the lifestyle that I want to like kind of offer to people? And when I wrote that out, it, it, I, I realized I was like, oh, this is a big, big project. So I was like, how can I take pieces of this and maybe just like, let's look at just breath, like there's a course or like whatever. And so just that, that master plan, I think is really valuable for anybody if they're trying to, it doesn't matter what you're doing in your life. It's like, what's the most grandiose vision of it or version of it? And then like, let's distill that out into smaller fragments. And then those fragments will eventually build the grander thing. Yeah. Yeah. And what's really interesting is, um, one of the things that I really respect and, and look to you as a great example of is, is that lifestyle. Uh, mm -hmm. and you, I, I want to go back a little bit further in just a sec, but you've really cultivated the actions, the habits, the beliefs of mm -hmm. the lifestyle that you live and therefore mm -hmm. it's automatic, but mm -hmm. to share that with people. Yeah that is that project yeah. that you're talking about, that big ass project where you've been building it. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to write that stuff down. You could, mm -hmm. but in order to share that with other people and really understand what got you to that point, your process, yeah. what you value, um, it, it takes that, that work. Yeah. And, and I think when you do have something that you're really passionate about and you recognize, Hey, this is something that I want to share with people. Um, that is part of the work. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there is this aspect of, let's say structure, um, that, uh, 
that people talk about, you know, having structure, having a plan. And I think all that's really valuable. Uh, what that facilitates though, for people that let's say have not been able to cultivate that for themselves, that allows them to start to do that and start to build something for themselves. Mm. And so, um, Sometimes you stumble into it mm -hmm. just by way of, hey, I value this, I value this, and I want to put more energy into this and that, and here we go. That's the lifestyle I'm living. And then you got to re reverse engineer it. And then yeah. other people, they either take someone else's plan, mm -hmm. and usually if they take someone else's plan and follow it to a T and it doesn't work for them, then they're like, well, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's not the work. The work is <laughs> like finding what's valuable mm -hmm. to you or shifting it and making it work for you. Right. Um, I was having this conversation with my buddy Jordan and he said something to the effect of, um, you know, nobody has the answers. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, yeah, I think that's accurate. But like the reframe there is like, we all have the answers it's inside of us or it's source coming down through us, whatever you believe. Right. But it's all inside of us. But those answers are unique to the experiences and let's say the the vision that we're orienting ourselves mm -hmm. to. So even though we have a lot in common, our visions, there's like where we want to go in life, there's, we're not going to end up in the exact same spot. And so base, that's based on past experiences and what we want to create and based on what's inside of us, those answers are inside of us, but I only have the answers for me. Yeah. So you can just send me a template. Mm -hmm. I can send you a template. I can send you a program, whatever. It's only going to get you so far unless you start to integrate that into what you like, what you believe. Mm -hmm. Question, question the, the, the guru or the, yeah. the, the master, or the mentor, um, question that stuff because ultimately those answers are inside of you. I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, I was going to say, um, the thing that comes up for me is question with compassion. Mm, yeah. And so something, I, we might have talked about this. I was talking about it with somebody recently. The, you know, there's all these, the guru figures out there, right? The dogmas, the system, the movement systems, animal flow, move nat, like liver king or the <laughs> vegan Brian Johnson biohacker, right? Like everybody has this camp. And as opposed to like looking at these camps with what are they doing wrong or what do I disagree with? Let's question with compassion and say, what are the things I agree with? Where are the, what are the gold nuggets of truth here? Like who gives a shit that that dude's on the sauce or whatever, you know, it's like, what's he saying that is meaningful and that could add value and then leave everything else. You don't have to have judgment for the other stuff. You don't have to talk shit about the other stuff. You take the things of value and it's like, where's the value that's applicable to my life? Because I, I think more often than not, everybody has something of value and a gold nugget to share with every other person. It's like every person you meet has knowledge in an area or experience or a truth that would impact you in a positive way that you do not currently possess. And so it's like, look for that rather than look for the differences. It's like, yeah. look, look for those consilient things. So it's like, yeah, question with compassion. I love yeah. that. I think that's, that's a, a really good thing to hammer home here because um, the questioning you see this so much on social media. You see it so much, uh, just in this, uh, attention grabbing space. The, the question is more of this challenge or the question. Somebody is asking a question that they have already made their mind up about, mm -hmm. right? Or they're mm -hmm. asking it in a way that is going to elicit a response so they can respond in a particular way mm -hmm. and be like, Oh, I got gotcha. you. Or, yeah. Oh, uh, no, no. You know, and so there's a ton of that that we see all the time. And to question something with compassion comes from a place of curiosity. And then this also goes into something that we talked about on the phone a few days ago. Um, I really like to look at these these words that are these behaviors that are like demonized or penalized in our mm -hmm. society. And one of the words that really stands out to me is ignorance. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think ignorance and curiosity, like can really go together because if you're ignorant to something, um, that word ignore, ignorant, right? So it's like, you're ignoring something out there mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in the world, some sort of awareness, right? Uh, in order to be enlightened to it, mm -hmm. you 
that you pair ignorance with curiosity. And people are so afraid to be called ignorant or, or be told that they're wrong or, or uh, that being thrown certain labels like racist, sexist, uh, whatever, that they're afraid to ask questions and be curious. And so they actually end up being in that dirty word of ignorance rather than, hey, I'm ignorant to this and I'm going to get curious and I'm going to explore more of that. Mm -hmm. And so to question with compassion, uh, it's not a gotcha. It's, uh, hey, yeah, uh, bring me up to your level. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think that's one of the things when people get asked questions that are, quote unquote, ignorant, they just want to kick people. Mm -hmm. They want to keep them down and be like, how dare you ask that rather than be like, oh, that's where your level of awareness is. Well, mm -hmm. let me rather than look at that as something that's bad. Look at this person's curious and they want to learn. And maybe that maybe they are truly ignorant. Right. But they could be curious and they want to learn something and they want to become more enlightened to what you have to offer. And so, uh, it goes with questioning with compassion and then, uh, responding with compassion yeah. as well. So, yeah. well, that, that genuine curiosity that someone may have, um, you can like frame a question and like, Hey, I do disagree with you, but I'm curious, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's like you, you're asking in a way to say like, yeah, I, I might not agree, but I am genuinely curious why you think this way. And I'm not going to judge you for thinking that way. I just want to seek understanding, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that, it's that seeking of understanding that allows us to grow. Because I've definitely disagreed with somebody and I sought to understand. And then I actually found some common ground. I was like, you know, like your viewpoint, like I can actually see this argument and I can, I can take part of that into my, my paradigm. Yeah. And I think allowing your paradigm to be ever expanding, ever shifting and evolving is so important. And allow it to be shattered once in a while. Like let your parents, you know, like, <laughs> like let yourself be like, absolutely like, wow, my whole worldview is like incorrect. Uh huh. And, and maybe it was just incorrect for that moment, you know? Cause I think it, like I've, I've fluctuated back and forth between different, different beliefs, like just in like the world of movement, you know? And now I finally land on a place. I'm like, it's all fucking good, man. It's just how you do it. Like, yeah. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, it's. There's differences, but it all comes back to really being the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to bring things back. Like I think we're lacking a little context with the conversation in terms of your life experience. And so, sure. um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd love to get a little... I know some of the, sometimes this is tough to do, but like, you know, in like three to five minutes, like uh, the, the tale of Nate, like what brought you to this, this point sure. in your life? Sure. So I'm from Colorado, like been here since I was two. Uh, I grew up in the front range. So wet, just west of Denver and Evergreen. So I was definitely like outdoors a lot as a kid. And I think that's a, that through line, that nature piece is a big through line to my story. So the access to the outdoors was huge. Um, and then always was interested in some type of play or movement as a kid, as most kids are. But anytime I was in team sports, I wasn't attracted to it. Mm. So I tried soccer and baseball and football and didn't just never resonated. I didn't have as a kid, I, I was much more independent. So I really didn't have that team dynamic. And so that got me into exploring a little bit more gymnastics stuff, Taekwondo. So I did gymnastics, Taekwondo, elementary school, middle school. And then in high school, uh, wound up in a weightlifting, powerlifting program and was doing Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu but also discovered marijuana and alcohol and all these drugs. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, all these are great. So, so I, I, you know, and let me, let me back up too. It was also working concurrently in the culinary industry. And that's when I started that other journey in my life. So it's like movement, food, and anything to shift my consciousness were three really big pieces of who I am today and who I was then. Um, but so fast forward a little bit, I decided to go to culinary school and I stopped doing any kind of movement. And I really focused more on partying as much as I could, changing my state of mind as much as I could because I didn't feel secure in my own skin and I didn't feel secure in any kind of like intimate relationship that didn't involve drugs or alcohol. Cause I felt like I needed that to actually like tell people what I thought and be vulnerable and be emotional. Um, 
and that all led to, you know, probation and getting in a lot of trouble and making some mistakes, which ultimately gave me some reflection to say, hey, like, what was the thing that like always made me happy? And it was like this journey of health and wellness and movement. Because weirdly enough, I was always interested in that, even though I was partying all the time. It's just the partying was like the addiction. And then I would be reading books about consciousness and I'd be reading nutrition books and stuff. But then like go to the fucking bathroom and rail a line and then go to class. <laughs> like just not, you know, I was, I was like a, you know, had, I was an interesting di like duality for me as a kid. And uh, that, that time of probation went back, started, you know, like I stepped on a scale one day and I was like, the same weight I am now, but not a good version of it. It's just the very fluffy, soft version of it. I'm like, man, this isn't okay. So evaluated my diet, cut stuff out, went back to the gym, started exploring movement again, but from a, a completely different lens. Cause I was listening to, you know, I'm kind of jumping ahead in time, but then I discovered the rewild yourself podcast with Daniel Vitalis and he had on this guy, Earl on the core. And this was in 2014. And so I was 22 at the time, or 23. And Irwan's a natural movement guy. I was really drawn to it, went and got certified in that. And I thought I was like this badass mover when I went to do the certification. Cause I was like, oh, I rock climb and slack line. And I used to weight lift and like, I knew fucking nothing. Like, <laughs> you know, I go and do the cert and I'm like immediately humbled. Um, thinking I was good at these things that really, I'm like, no, you haven't really spent that much time developing the way your body moves and integrating these things. And so that was the, the, the start of the journey for me going from MoveNet and then studying at the Czech Institute and then studying with uh, Guy Voyer who created Aldoa's a myofascial stretching system, um, doing as much nutrition training as I could. And then yeah, back in school for anatomy physiology. So, you know, like I thought I wanted to be the chef and then I realized like the food aspect for me is more about the passion of that at home and then teaching other people. Mm. I don't really have a desire to own a restaurant, but I do have a desire to continue to, to teach about cooking and to like provide nourishment for people and my friends and family. Um, so that to me is that whole holistic lifestyle, right? And I just, if I'm really honest with myself, I just traded my addictive tendencies for drugs, alcohol, for like healthy living and fitness. And it's like, I, I am well aware that I do get this yearning for movement and there is a bit of an addiction there, but it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, it's really serving a greater good for myself and other people. It's making me a better person for other people. So I, I, I tell uh, my nephew this, he's 17. So I've had some real honest conversations, but I tell him like, you know, I have a dragon inside me and the dragon of addiction. So I'm like, I gotta like feed the dragon. <laughs> Otherwise, if I don't feed the dragon something, it's gonna just like, the dragon's gonna go on a bender yeah. and like <laughs> terrorize the village. Uh -huh. um, but that's like, that's my story in a nutshell. So now like where I'm at today is like really taking this wild, wild ride of a life I've had going from like smoking crack with homeless people and like <laughs> to, you know, back squatting with like elite athletes once in a while. And like, that's like a, that transition is totally possible. And it was just by virtue of having some self love and knowing that like, I am enough where I am right now or like with who I am and that I don't need something else to shift me into a state of mind to be positive with other people that I can just be that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's hard to Man. summarize it all. In Dude, minutes, I, I mean, so. you did a really good job. <laughs> okay. You did a really good job. <laughs> Learned some things about you that, uh, you mm. know, um, I had, you know, some some reference to, but mm -hmm. but not really some of those details. And I appreciate you take us, take us on that ride. A, a, a well-told story and gives, gives some context of, of yeah. you know, what you're really looking to share. And I, I think, you know, what we started with is really good to talk about like more of the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. of you know, what we go through as coaches and creators and, and people that want to, um, share, mm -hmm. uh, our lives. And, with, and it's a act of service. Yeah. It's an We're, act of service. I mean, there's, there's aspects of, 
um, <clears throat> I mean, everything that you said there, there's, I resonate with, I didn't have those exact same experiences, mm-hmm. but, um, there's, there's so much in there in terms of, uh, kind of being down and out and, um, getting to a, a point of, you know, rock bottom or, or where you re- really don't have any other options, but to truly assess with where you're at. Yeah. And that can be a really dark place, but to show up with some sort of self love in those moments, you can start to see those, those beautiful aspects of Mm -hmm. that person that you are, the potential. Are there any particular moments along that journey that, uh, and feel free to dive into detail, um, where your reality was completely shattered and you were at a point where you're like, all right, well, there are all the pieces and they are put together in this one way. Mm -hmm. How do I want to put them together in another way? Yeah. So the, there was a six week period. I was uh, 19 years old. I was just about to turn 20. And in this moment of time was the most like, what the fuck are you doing? So I, this all tied together. I had a friend, my best friend, like from childhood when I was uh, 15 years old, just about to turn 16, he passed away. And he was like my, like a brother basically. So that shattered me, right? Like that, that shattered me. And that's when I, my one friend, our good friend was like, Hey, you want to smoke weed with me? And that just became my life. So what I was doing there was suppressing all this emotion. So then when I was 19, the six week period I was talking about, I'm partying all the time. I had been awake for 48 hours straight and being totally raw and honest here. I was on cocaine. I was on acid. I had been drinking alcohol nonstop. I probably ate once or twice in 48 hours, just doing drugs, hanging out with some pretty sketchy people. And I was like, I want to keep riding this high. So I go back to my house, grab some acid, eat the acid. I go up to this mountain pass, this beautiful, massive view. And I don't, don't do this. Don't drive while you're doing these things. Um, drove up there and I'm staring over this view and I never have service in this place. And this was over 10 years ago. And I, you know, I didn't even have a smartphone. I just had like a shitty flip phone. Somehow I get a voicemail come through. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck? Like I'd been to this area tons of times, never had service. The voicemail's from the counselor at the culinary school. And he says, you're getting kicked out of school if you don't come in right now. I need to see you in the next two hours. And I was like, oh fuck. And I'm just like strung out, out of my mind on, twisted on drugs, go to school. I had up until that point had a 3.8 GPA until that quarter. It was the last quarter of culinary school. And I just like started just not showing up to class. And because of how many classes I missed, it had dropped my GPA significantly. And then there was also like, you know, the policy of actually showing up to class. And he's like, you have this one class that if you don't get it up to a C, then, you know, we're kicking you out. And so I, did not, I didn't, I, I talked to the professor, the chef and, you know, he says he's going to do it. He doesn't do it. I get kicked out of school. I'm like, I think I need to go to rehab. You know, I'm like just crying, crying, crying. I like start bawling and I realize I'm crying so much that I realize it was like the last four ish years of suppressed emotion that I hadn't cried since my friend had died, mm. that I hadn't really shown any real emotion since then unless i was super fucked up and so i'm just like oh my god this is more than just there's like so much going on here and then it was like even trauma from childhood coming out like all kinds of stuff started to really open up and then i go to my chef at the restaurant i'm working at i'm working at a fine dining restaurant and that's what i was taking really seriously like i was taking the the experiential hands-on work incredibly serious and i kind of my ego made me feel like i was above the people in culinary school because I, like, it would like when I would go to class, I was like, Oh, this is all so easy. You know, I'm like, I'm fucking doing this. I'm getting paid to do this at work. And like, I'm, I'm doing like way cooler shit than you guys are doing. It was just this total ego trip as a young, you know, 19 year old kid. And so I felt like I was above that, which is why I wasn't going. And I was like, I, I'm better suited to just have fun during this class. Like why I should just go like drink some whiskey with my buddies or something. And so go talk to my chef. I say, Hey man, I need, 
I need like a week or two weeks to figure shit out. And he, you know, rightfully so, was pretty pissed at me because he was, you know, he was actually a very good mentor and he was really like challenging me to be better and wanted me to do good in school and all this stuff. And he, he thought he was doing the right thing, but really he was like, all right, you get fucking six weeks off. He gave me six weeks off and I just went on a bender. I was like mad at him. And I just went on a like the ultimate tirade possible and it ended with me drifting my car drunk and then snapping the tie rod, blasting through two trees, ripping the roof off the car, walking out of the car unscathed, and this thing is completely demolished. The doors are ripped off, the roof is gone, like it was it was totally destroyed. And I get out unscathed, go to jail that night, I have to sleep next to uh, meth heads in a sober house that are like talking to me while I'm sleeping and they're like standing over my bed and I'm like, oh my God, this is not what I wanna, this is not the life I wanna <laughs> like be living right now. And so that, that all led to, like I had kind of said, probation, but that like earth shattering moment was the, the big, big realization. And then it still took a year of me being on probation to like, like I kept trying to work the system and that's, I'm like, dude, you are like such an addict. Like you keep trying to like work around all these drug tests you have to do and everything. And I was like an A student on probation. Um, you know, at least that's what they thought. And so my second year of it is when that big switch finally happened. And I was just like, I'm done. Like there was just literally like a cold turkey moment of just like, I'm changing everything, changing my life. Yeah. Um, and I did. And it all, like, like since then, I remember it was, it was uh, May of 2014. So I had, yeah, what is that, like seven months left on probation. And yeah, May of 2014 just, like, completely changed and stepped back onto the path that I'm on now. Yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really interesting because it's, there's so many moments where you're just like, you're listening to this story. I'm listening to this story. I'm like, when's he going to get it? And when you, yeah. when you're talking about it too, mm -hmm. I imagine as you're telling the story, you're like, how did I not get it then? How did yeah. I not get it then? Yeah. How did I get it then? But then there's just this moment. And the only reason it's special is because mm -hmm. it's, it's the moment that you truly decided. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, or, um, I've also heard this with addiction is, and I, I know that there are some forms of addiction and certain substances that are like really hard to break. And maybe mm -hmm. this mentality is not, it can still have its grips over you, but it's just the consistent effort and trying to quit. Mm. And eventually that happens, right? Yeah. The, what really felt like was just a choice. Yeah. At the end of the day, it was like, I had a, I had like a, a native Lakota elder say to me is like, he's like, anything you need to change in your life is like picking up a rock and letting it go. Mm. And he's like, it is, it is a choice that you, when you really actually decide to make it, it's like you were saying earlier that everyone has the answers within them. I, I knew I had all those answers. Every, all those you knew things. what to do. I knew what to fucking do. Yeah. I knew the whole time. You'd been studying it. That's yeah, I was interested. I was, I was <laughs> reading. The knowledge. I was reading Huxley and McKenna and like Ram Dass and all this stuff. But then I was looking at it from the lens of the the substance use, not the integration mm -hmm. of the lessons. Yeah, and it really took. And we could maybe segue into confidence. Well, yeah, it took the confidence to say, "No, I'm making this choice." I'm going to be, what's this beep? Is that your door? Oh, okay. Be, sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it took, the, it took the choice and the confidence to say, no, I'm changing now. Well, what gets in the way of that choice? Um, I mean, I mean you, like ourselves, right? Yeah. But for me, it was, uh, I think, fear ultimately of the fear of how much work I knew it was going to take. Mm. Like I knew, like I was, I was afraid of like, like what it was going to take to get my body back. I was afraid of what it was going to take to 
you know, start learning to cook a different way. And like, I'm like, I already learned all this stuff, you know, I learned this, these different things. I'm like, I don't want to do it again. And I was just writing like for, for so long, like I had, I had a lot of like physical success in high school with my body. And so I was just like riding those coattails until it was like my metabolism because of the, the drug use and stuff was completely destroyed. And then it just like, I'm like, oh dude, like you haven't done shit for a year and a half, two years. Like what, what are you expecting that you're going to go back into the gym, be just as flexible and strong and all the stuff that you were before. So I was like, yeah, it was just like ultimately fear of work. Like for me, it was like this like procrastination. Cause I'm like, man, I'm gonna have to put a lot of effort to get this done. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that's a really interesting question to examine. You know, if there is a choice that one has to make in their life or they, they know the choice, mm -hmm. they, they, it's not, it's not, Oh, what choice do I make? You know, the path. Yeah. yeah. Like, but you just, just, you finally decide yeah. like you did on that particular day. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, I wonder what is in the way of somebody just letting go of that rock. And, um, you know, I've been, I have the book, I've read the book, I've listened to it twice, uh, letting go by David Hawkins. Mm. And it's, uh, it's a whole lot of that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. And, and yet sometimes when things are said in the book, conceptually, they make sense. But then when I try to implement them in my life, they seem like it's the hardest fucking thing ever. Yeah. Right. And so I, I, it's a question for me to consistently ask myself, you know, when I am faced with a choice, but it's, again, it's not a choice. Like I know the path. Mm -hmm. I know the answers. Yeah. Like, I have enough information to work with here. Yeah. And, and so what is preventing me from deciding? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. Well, and I think, uh, something that I know you're, you're into and more familiar with than I am, but like story work, right? So yeah. narrative work. So something for me that I, even back then before I had any concept of what story work was, I said, I, I'm choosing to not be an alcoholic. Therefore I'm not going to be a slave to the substance if I'm around it. Yeah. So, or any drug for that matter. So there's like, you know, I had to, I did AA meetings. Like I, I was like, to the point that I would shake if I didn't drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. I was truly an alcoholic. I woke up with whiskey on my bedside table. And, but now I can, like, we've had cocktails together. Yeah. And it doesn't spiral me out. And to me, that was also a choice. I was choosing to say, no, there's a story about alcohol, but I knew that the, the alcohol is not the problem. The, the drugs are not the problem. The problem is your relationship to those things. And what are those things either giving you or allowing you to su suppress or escape from? Mm -hmm. And it's that su suppression and escapism or the, the, the fallacy and delusion that they're giving you something that you don't already possess. Yeah. And so I really made in that, in that same decision, like the choice was like full sobriety and I was fully, fully sober for over a year, like not even caffeine or anything. And then I was like, you know, I can, I, I have a wonderful wife now and my partner at the time when I met her, Larissa, she is very much not an addict in any kind of way. And she like was like, oh, let's just have like a glass of wine. I was like, yeah, I'll have a glass of wine. And it was just, it was easy for me to like, not feel like I was compelled to continue these bad habits. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, the, the story around it is so huge. Yeah. It's, um, you know, some of the, the statements you made, I think you can even take those a step further. Like I'm choosing not to give, uh, my power to alcohol. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I I'm choosing to own my power. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, a statement where if you really breathe into that, really feel it, that's something that you can start to create a paradigm shift for yourself. And, um, yeah, I mean, the story works really powerful. The other aspect is, you have this narrative or this story attached to, in this case, substance, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there is a, a fear of the unknown. Yeah. And this could be, okay, what is this really, what is, what does my life look like without the relationship to this substance? Yeah. That is unknown, mm -hmm. right? So maybe that's the scary part about it. Maybe it's, it's, um, 
maybe it's the shifting of what that relationship is with this where, you know, oh, this has power over me. Uh, how can I shift that where I take my power back? And that doesn't necessarily mean that I have to completely abstain. Because I think that's another potential giving away of power yeah. that one can have when it comes to substances. And mm -hmm. um, my one big criticism of more of the, the AA 12 steps is that they always continue. They, they want you to continue to identify as an addict mm. and you're still in the story of being an addict. Yeah. Like you've never been able to reframe that because the system that you're going through is telling you I'm an addict. Yep. Or there are you like, you must identify as an addict. If you forget that you're an addict, then you're going to slip back into it. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a lot of great stuff in in 12 steps and there's oh, a, yeah. there's there's incredible material there but that is my one gripe is there's never a questioning with compassion yeah well you know am i an addict yeah or how do i want to how do i want to view myself is it is it going to be that for the rest of my life yeah is that beneficial to me because that still has power over me if i'm viewing myself as an addict or i'm viewing myself as tied to this substance and i can't use it because if I do, it's going to take me down, down this, this spiral. How did you start to build up your confidence after being mm. at such a low spot? This is kind of a funny way to put it. I guess I, I realized I'm like, I always had game, you know, like just not just with like, like a relationship or anything, but just like, I was actually like somebody like people wanted to connect with. Cause my biggest thing was like this social anxiety piece mm -hmm. that I felt like it was difficult for me to connect with people. But in actuality, like I had a very easy, great time connecting with people and I really enjoyed it, but it was just repetition, you know, ultimately. Yeah. And, and, uh, not, not being, and we can go like use this word cause we talked about this the other day, but not being arrogant. And so, knowing when I had a limit and knowing that I wanted to, cause I found myself being with like lots of things internally. Like I would, I would tell people, oh, I, I don't really, I'm not like competitive, but internally, like I'm super fucking competitive. <laughs> Any man yeah, that says yeah, that is yeah, lying. Yeah, <laughs> we, are, we are competitive it, yeah, by nature. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I, you know, I started to realize like I had this like competitiveness with the stupidest shit. You know, like I would be like in the gym and I'd like see what someone else is doing. I'm like, I could do more than that. You know, <laughs> like, and so it was, but it was like, it, I, I again, like tried to reframe it and I'm like, where can this competition or this competitive energy feed me and help me build my confidence in different things? And it was just allowing myself to, uh, to fail, honestly. Mm. And so allowing myself to like, again, shatter my paradigm. You know, whether it was like, I'm trying the bulletproof diet and then realizing like, oh, my thyroid's failing. Like I, I was wrong and admitting that you're wrong and that, that admission of fault and admission and being vulnerable of any of your failings, that's where I found the most confidence because I'm like, if I can be this raw about my life in front of people and the ways I fucked up and the way, you know, the, the stupid decisions I made that gave me confidence because mm -hmm. I was like, cause then when I have wins, I'm like not in the, the, the shadow side of pride, but then I have genuine pride in myself where it makes me feel good. And I ultimately, the things I do in my life and I said it before is like, I, you know, the industries I've always been in, like cooking, coaching, like what late labor, it's always service. It's always been acts of service. And so I try to sit in those acts of service from a really authentic place. And this is really a convoluted answer, but like, but for like those acts, acts of service, like give me confidence to keep moving forward and keep trying things. Yeah. Uh, acting and yeah. being of service, like yeah. those two things I think are, are going to give anybody some mm -hmm. sense of confidence and, and, uh, taking action, um, you know, it's not a matter of if you fail, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's when, yeah. how often, yep. and honestly, how often might be more beneficial. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, this is something that 
has really been coming up for me and in terms of questions that I have or people asking me questions and uh, sometimes the, the questions that I receive um, whether I, I'm, I'm asking them to myself or someone is uh, asking them to me, I'm like, you know, this, Mm -hmm. you know, this, and even if you don't, you know how to find out. Yeah. And that's through action. So, you know, the questions that one has, let's say, Oh, will the bulletproof diet help me achieve these particular goals? Mm -hmm. Well, you got the answer through action, not reading a bunch of articles and whatnot. That's Mm -hmm. not action. That might support action, but it's not, it's not the actual lived experience. Mm -hmm. And well, there's, there's absolutely people out there that have success with the bulletproof diet. And so they have found their answers, but Mm -hmm. you found yours. Are there any, um, like examples of, and I'll say, yeah, examples of, of men that, Mm -hmm. uh, that you were able to be in contact with throughout this journey that really inspired you and motivated Mm you. Mm. I'll give you some, the early on examples. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really early on, it was interesting. I, I kind of isolated myself from my whole friend group. Honestly, like I pretty much only hung out with Larissa for like a year or two. And I had some friends actually like feel a little hurt by it. But I had to tell them, I'm like, look, you guys, your whole life still revolved around partying. And I just didn't want to be a part of that. And so I had one friend, this cat named Vinny, who now his name is Unity. He's a really lovely guy. But he was like somebody who was just like, like really authentic and just living his life and like following his mission. And, you know, his mission is, is like agriculture and farming and medicine and uh, working with indigenous people. And he was just really living it and truly doing it. And so even though I was in sort of a similar vein, but like my own path, my own version of that, he inspired me just seeing him do the work. And then the the podcaster I had mentioned, Daniel Vitalis. I mean, like I became just like addicted to the Rewild Yourself podcast, listened to every episode multiple times. And just his whole lifestyle was like, this is the thing I want to kind of integrate. This is the thing I want to go for. So that was those two individuals early on in the, in 2014, 2015, at the start of my journey, that was, those were the two that really struck a chord with me. And then it was finding more community. And like, I think just calling in men like yourself over the years that have been like, not only people I can call friends and brothers, but like sources of inspiration. Like I watch your content and I'm, always inspired by it and motivated. I don't like initially early on, not with you specifically, but with like certain friends doing cool shit, I would get that competitive, like, Oh, what the fuck? You know, like I want to do that. Like, you know, this like weird kind of jealous. And now it's just like, no dude, like my boy's killing it. I'm stoked. Like I see my friends doing like cool shit and I get really excited about it. And so I've really like learned to like take that as inspiration. Uh, the other one, I, I, the other buddy I mentioned, Matt, you know, I met him in uh, like 2016 or 17 and he was, he was a hunter and he was like more into weightlifting, which I had been out of weightlifting for a long time and he was a Marine and he had this just like total, you've met him, you know, he's just like this warrior energy mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, I need like, I need some of that yeah. in my life. And so I, I, I try to find people that. I can have both a mentor mentee relationship with. You always need people you can teach. You always need to be taught from somebody and you always need people that you can bounce equal ideas back and forth with. And I think the best friends are all three of those things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, like for you, like I get so much value from you. I feel like I get to give value to you and then we can have this discourse the equal level like where's well you're a little higher up than me like, you know, <laughs> well, you're a little bigger yeah, person, yeah. so you okay. know it works out yeah uh yeah man i mean that's uh i i really appreciate you tying in both uh with uh, an in-person example and then also this this digital world we live in where we can connect with somebody because sometimes people feel like they 
don't have any sort of community that they can relate to mm-hmm. or relate with on, on these things that they're passionate about. And maybe they're shot down by, yeah. uh, by the people that are closer to them when it comes to topics like this. And so it helps to have, you know, somebody yeah. that, <laughs> that is, is, uh, you know, getting, getting really, uh, into the nitty gritty, the, the in-depth, the vulnerable nature of, mm-hmm. of some of these things. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to the competition aspect, it's, it's very mm. interesting you brought that up because like I've found that as a man and, and especially when it comes to movement and skills and capability and, and all that, there's a, there can totally be this comparison that comes up and, and, um, it's always a great opportunity for me to pause and recognize like, is that something that I really want? Mm. And then if it is, what sort of work is required to do that? Mm -hmm. And am I in the position to allocate my energy and my resources towards that? And, you know, so I think there's these moments where we get humbled. Like for instance, we were in castle rock and, uh, you and other Nate, uh, were, were showing me, uh, what the, uh, the uh, tuck pop up, the tuck pop up, which mm-hmm. is like this this move that when you see Nate do it, it's like, oh yeah, I could do that. Like kind of that <laughs> arrogance, you know. Yeah. Like I'm strong, I'm a mover, you know. But then there's a piece where it's not just how strong you are or yeah. how good of a mover you are, or whatever. There's a skill aspect to it that's required, yeah. and and I think that's probably what you experienced when you went to move Nat. Uh, and, and just getting humbled. And, and I think, you know, there's a range of, of emotions that can come up with getting humbled in those situations. Um, and it's important to feel all of them and then let them go and really yeah. see what's there, uh, because there's a ton of value. So when I do see somebody doing something crazy when it comes to strength and I'm like, Oh man, I'd really like to do that. You know, it's like, Okay, really ask myself like is that something that mm-hmm. i really want to put in the work to do yeah uh, and does that have me sacrificing some things that i am currently putting my resources to so it's a great opportunity to question and be inspired i think it's not inspired to do that exact thing necessarily mm-hmm. it might be uh but it can be like oh wow this person's out there getting it and they yeah. achieve that that goal that skill that whatever it is and what is that for me yeah. And that's what I, I've, I've really valued from just some really high performing units of friends, mm-hmm. like some people that really push me and that competitive spirit of being a man, like how do I channel that energy into something that is, is really more, um, uh, beneficial for me, but then also like collaborative and cooperative. So like, I made a ton of mistakes, like Mm -hmm. smoking the meat today, right? Yeah. But I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to to get that rep. Mm -hmm. It's not like you were holding my hand. It's not like Mm -hmm. you were here. It was like you gave me the recipe. You're like, this is what you're going to do and and all this. And and, uh, and I, there are parts of me that were like, well, Nate's really good at this. Like, Mm -hmm. what is he going to think of all this, right? (laughs) And, but then you were just being such a good example mm. in terms of giving me the confidence, mm. right? Giving me the opportunity being like, Hey dude, you're fully capable of doing this. And it's not hard. Like, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's just, I haven't done it. So like the, 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 uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't built that confidence in that particular realm. And so it's like, well, how do I do that? Yeah. I got to get reps and, I, and it helps to have somebody that's supportive of that and encouraging, encouraging me, um, to, to take those steps. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to confidence, of course, taking action, having great examples, and then those great examples, they're showing you more than telling you mm-hmm. We're tying it in. We don't really have much to show you today. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. but, it's but, more tell, but it's more the, tell. what we are showing you. And I think what, what, one of the reasons I really wanted to have Nate on here is he shows me every single time I'm around him uh, how to be uh, a great dude, mm. how to be a, a uh, modern day renaissance man. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really curious about this. Like what motivates you now? Mm. 
Like what keeps you going in your pursuits? Mm. Uh, a more beautiful world. You know, I think ultimately like I don't know how great my impact is going to be, but I want to have a positive impact on people in place, like place being the world we're in. Right. And so I think of everyone's heard this metaphor analogy of just like the stone in the water, you throw a pebble in the water and it creates ripples. Right. And so every, every pebble you can throw in is another ripple and pebble is an act of service or whatever. And for me, like, I know I've helped a lot of people and made a huge impact on many people, which I do not take lightly. I, I feel that becomes very rewarding for me, but I also, I, I want to be, I want to continue that authenticity of helping people out of, out of kindness and out of like, that's my mission. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes like with clients, I'm charging them obviously, but that's the world we live in. But I'm still, I want to put myself in a position to help people beyond whatever my rate is, right? And so like one example more recently, like I have a client who literally like, you know, he told me like I, I went to a show with him. He's like, dude, you've fully like changed my life. And he's like, I feel like I'm on like, like this is like the path of the lifestyle like I want to pursue. And that's like to me like such a huge win because you're, I want to help create a world where there's more people that give a fuck about themselves and the people they're around, you know, and the more you can spread that it's, it's so powerful. Um, but I did have a, an anecdote going to what you were talking about with like the smoking, the meat or whatever mm -hmm. and, and establishing a skill, knowing you're capable. So I just recently taught the, the move net level three, which is the natural movement, the highest level, the hardest certification. And it covers a huge array of skills. And you know, I've, this is my fifth time doing it, third time teaching it. So I did it once. And I did it after a significant mountain bike injury and I, which didn't really impact me passing or failing. I, f I failed four tests that really had nothing to do with the injury, but mentally I was kind of shook going into the event. So the next year I go back, I pass everything and I felt so good in my body, but it was like a different kind of version of me now. You know, I was 165 when I passed L3 for the first time, 195 now, like a different athletic in both ways, but I'm like a different kind of athlete now. And now teaching it, you know, thankfully I'm teaching it with our, the other Nate you mentioned, Nate Amato, and then this woman, Diana. And so we kind of like split like who's teaching what. And what I really realized on this last event is like how fucking difficult it is to keep all those skills sharp mm. at the same time. And so like one in particular, which gets most people is the high rail balance. So it's an inch and a half rail and you have to walk down and back. You have to do a muscle up on it if you're a man or a, a roll up. Um, if you're a woman, like a gymnastic skill, then you have to do, you have to crawl across it and then do like a, a kick through position on the rail, but it's seven feet in the air. And when I owned the gym and when I passed it the first time, I had tons of seven foot high rails. I was walking back and forth on constantly. I had all day to do it. You know, I'd teach a class, didn't have another class for six hours. So I would just play for hours on end on a daily basis, got really confident, really good at it, but it was this confidence piece there. Because almost anybody can walk across a rail when it's ground level, right? Or at least like attempt it and do it and not feel to a lack of confidence. Um, as it goes up and up and up, it's not so much a skill anymore because you can build the skill, the exact same skill, a foot off the ground. Now it's confidence and now it's fear that's getting in the way. And so for me, I actually found myself really struggling with that high balance on this last event. And so I kind of have a question I want to put into the atmosphere is like, what do you do when your confidence wavers or when you had confidence in an area, but now you've lost the confidence? Like, what would you do in that scenario? Hmm. Yeah. It's like, uh, I think the first place to go would be, Oh, just like keep working on it. Mm -hmm. But like you're in your head Yeah. and fear's creeping in there. And so, um, yeah, I think it, space could be something, space from it, mm. like doing something else, mm -hmm. um, to show that, Hey, you are capable, uh, would be, would be one approach. Um, I've had that several times with, uh, uh, I'm not doing a ton of structured dance right now, but I, there was like a period of like nine months where I was doing a ton of structured dance and I like forgot how to like 
groove. Oh, uh, yeah. Like me. Yeah. You know? Uh, I was like so into the structure and that freaked me out. Mm. Like, it really did. And I was like, oh my God, what's going on? Same thing happened with Hacky Sack. I was like, I'm going to, I have a course out there for Hacky Sack. And uh, I was like, I'm going to practice for 45 days straight every mm. single day. And then I'm going to film it in that week after that. Mm -hmm. And I remember there were like maybe two week long bouts where like I just sucked like I, I literally felt like I had lost all my skill mm. and uh, like those basketball players in Space Jam yeah. when, when the monsters <laughs> take their yeah. take their skills right it yeah. was exactly like that and I just I uh, exactly no, yeah. Uh, yeah. but that's what it felt like um, and I had lost the and those are pretty like low stakes skills right it's not yeah. like I'm balancing on something there. yeah yeah. So I do think like proving to yourself and in, in these other ways can can help build that confidence mm. back up. Just um, and then also recognizing like the level of importance that you're putting on a particular task mm -hmm. and like maybe how it's like defining your identity. Yeah. Like if I don't if I'm not able to do this, then I'm a shitty mover, mm -hmm. right? or uh, I'm not strong, or that person's better than me, and you start to go into all this comparison narrative. And, and so taking a step back, maybe from the activity, since that's what it helps you do, right? Mm -hmm. But also just taking a step back mentally and recognizing, you know, hey, this is, I'm in my head, mm -hmm. and I can feel these emotions, I can go through these thoughts, but ultimately, like, can I let that go and mm -hmm. get back up on that, that rail? The other piece is, exposure time. So it's the opposite of what you're saying, which is giving space. But then the other one is like, okay, more exposure. Yeah. Right. And it's like more exposure, but layering difficulty. So starting with the easier and then layering that difficulty back on the same way you built the confidence in the first yeah. place before you lost it. Totally. But I think what's nice about anybody who has gained a skill, lost the skill and then regained it it comes back so much faster. Totally. Yeah. 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 No, that's that. I mean, that's, I'd say that's the most logical way of going about it and probably the most effective, you know, yeah. cause you're, you're taking action mm -hmm. and you're pr providing evidence that you're capable. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the big thing, uh, yeah. especially if there is something that you're working towards and getting better at. Can I, can I plug some science? Sure. Science into this bitch. Yeah. So. <laughs> There's a, I can't remember the study. I can't quote the, the author or whatever, but you talked about like creating space from the thing, maybe yeah. doing something else. So they did this study with, and it was a movement based study and that was related to learning. And so they actually showed that when they had like four different skills or whatever they were, and then people, they had certain people work like basically on one skill fully, and then they got to go to the next one until they got it and then they go to the next one. And then the other group would spend like five to 10 minutes on this, five, 10 minutes on that, and then they would rotate through. And they would, so they would just task switch basically. Yeah. And then the group that actually task switched, so they went from like, they did, you know, the five to 20 minute work on this thing, switch. They actually learned all four skills faster than the group that spent all their time on the one thing until they got it and then did the next thing. So it's like, the idea there is space. Right, space. you're creating space, and what you're you're allowing your nervous system and your your mind to do, your subconscious is to integrate. It's like eating a meal. It's like, would you want to eat all three thousand of your calories in one meal, or would you be like, oh, I'm going to have a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and space it out? And so it's it's so much easier to digest and absorb when you're creating that space. The said principle or the law of specificity, and like if you train something or you work mm -hmm. on something specific, you're going to get better at that specific thing. But what, what sort of context is lacking there is like that overall brain function. Yeah. So like, what are those other three tasks? What were they? Or are you I'm just, just saying, saying like, general? so if there were like four movements, right? Yeah. Like if I am doing balance work on mm -hmm. one and then I'm doing some coordination with my eyes or with a mm -hmm. ball or something like that. And then there's some sort of strength task mm -hmm. involved, which would have me feeling more grounded. 
I just look at those three things right there and I already see how mm-hmm. they feed into each other oh, 100%. versus yeah. just working on one of those things. And mm-hmm. so there's, there's kind of this byproducts of, of training and I've actually been experiencing this as I've do- dove more into some of this, um, the particular place that I've learned it from is, uh, this guy, Nathan, who runs, uh, this platform called MoveMed, mm. and it's taking a lot of like stuff from mewing mm. and what i'm seeing is it's a lot of active craniosacral therapy mm-hmm. so you're tying in your pelvic floor the you know there's some more depth to it but like basically valsalva maneuver and then you're tying that into the diaphragm of your, your well your breathing diaphragm and the diaphragm of your heart and then you got your palate and your throat through here and then you're also pairing that with your eyes Mm -hmm. and a lot of this is basically like a really nice integration of it is these ancient practices of like tai chi and qigong Mm. like or or martial arts in general right um uh ways to stay relaxed in higher stretch higher stress situations Mm -hmm. um how can i tap into more of my necessary tensions and eliminate Mm -hmm. unnecessary tensions and Mm -hmm. this can also be mental Mm -hmm. right that that unnecessary noise or tension that you have going through your head how do i clear that noise right um and so it's been really interesting when i do some of this work even swiss ball work i'll do yeah. some basic you know stuff from uh how to eat move move and be healthy and hop on the swiss ball and just do some basic balance drills uh and balancing on one of those parallettes and then mm-hmm. i'll go down to the basketball court Mm-hmm. Or I'll play with the hacky sack. Mm-hmm. And it, I have not worked on anything specific to those yeah. skills. And it is like wild mm-hmm. how consistent the experience is. And yeah, that's yeah. the key. Mm-hmm. Like my baseline is like, or my center or my sense of groundedness is there. Yeah. And I'm not trying to find it in the process. It's just mm-hmm. there. And therefore everything else can be automated. Mm-hmm. And so that is something you know, when it does come to training, I mean, we can really focus on the development of skill. And I think that's an amazing thing to focus on. But then when you start to see the byproducts of like some of the things that you are working on and how Mm -hmm. they translate to performance Mm -hmm. in those particular skills, that's when it goes like, whoa, Mm -hmm. this is valuable. And it's not a matter of training this specific skill. It's what skill am I going to train? Cause I have my bases covered with this stress relief work, this yeah. strength work, this balance work, this coordination work. Um, and, 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 and factoring all that into something that now it's not, Oh, am I training primal movement or, or am I training strength or am I training skill? Or it's, it just, again, starts to factor into this thing and mm-hmm. goes back to, man, I get to get better at the things that I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And that's me. Those are my answers for what I want to do for my life. Yeah. And so I think it's a a really cool thing. You know, I have been looking at this perspective of primal movement as I built this program where, you know, when I bring up primal movement to people, it's like, oh, it's that ground stuff, right? Mm. And it's like, yeah, but like, okay, if we take a look at the, the check primal patterns, all right? That's one way of looking at it. And then uh, you have like the primal movement, which is essentially an intensifier of human developmental movement. Mm -hmm. And so you got to look at the primary movement patterns that we go through. Then there's an even deeper layer that goes into some of the swallowing patterns and, and how to create pressure through the body and, 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 and different things like that, that are again, primal primary of Mm. most importance, what comes first. Mm. So with this program, something that I've really strived to provide is a nice balance of that really base level of human developmental movement. Mm. Um, The prototypical primal movement or animal movement that you see, animal locomotion, quadrupedal stuff, that is part of that human developmental movement, but we intensify it in some sexy ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then getting back to stuff that, you know, humans of any kind to really be considered a, a a mover 
just on a basic human level that squat, hinge, pull, push, mm. rotate, gate, stuff like that. Uh, I mean, that is, if everybody can be good at those things, like, you're a pretty well functioning human. Mm -hmm. And so combining all those and really categorizing it under primal movement, even though it is a label has been very freeing for me because now it's not this, Oh, I'm doing this or I'm doing yeah. this or I'm doing this. I'm literally just like, Oh, this is my practice. Yep. You know, and that's, so, that's something that I've, uh, debated around with as well. And I like the primal movement thing because, like, nobody really, like, owns that label right now, at least. Like, you know, there's uh, there's people like you. Kellen uses it. Mm -hmm. Check. Um, but it's... I don't like telling people, oh, I'm a MoveNet coach. Yeah. Because it's just another dogmatic thing. And the, the, the community, like, has become more of that lately. And sorry, MoveNet. But it's true. And... But the... You know, I do kettlebell work. I have a strength background. I like gymnastics. I like animal flow. I'm like, they're all fucking valuable. And so for me, like, I've been like, what is, what do I call this? And it's just movement, man. Yeah. It's just movement. And Primal movement, sure. Human movement, I yeah. think, is a, yeah. is a great one yeah. for there. It's, it's just one of those things when it comes to getting your message out. And I've really been challenged with this as well because I didn't, I didn't come up with the animal flow system. It's yeah. inspired my work greatly. Uh, but some of my biggest videos on this channel have popped because I put it under that label. Yeah. So thank you, Mike Fitch for making it accessible for people and making yeah. something that is popular and is marketable. And I think that's another piece that, um, often gets, uh, demonized mm -hmm. is, is how things are packaged up. You know, I get some people in the comments and if this is you, uh, it's a great opportunity for examination, but people are like, Oh, why would you do this stupid derivative of capoeira? Mm. Right. Capoeira provides so much more. Well, I've done capoeira. I think it's really valuable, mm -hmm. uh, on so many different levels. You have the movement level, you have the rhythm and music level, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you have the combat level and the interaction with people. And then also the community aspect. And so there's a lot of layers packed onto that. That's a lot for somebody to buy into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? If somebody just wants to move better, if somebody just wants to uh, express their body in a new way and, and be able to take that step, that's where I'm like, do animal flow. Mm -hmm. There's the ABCs of animal flow, right? Mm -hmm. Ape, beast, crab. There's like 20 moves. It's super simple. Mm -hmm. and it's a great starting point and i think when you start to get better at it or you start to expand your movement practice i recognize this with myself it had limitations yeah uh or or it didn't go in in directions that uh i wanted to go in and that's fine yeah right that's up to me to not be like animal flow sucks because yeah <laughs> don't clip this right yeah. but animal flow sucks because it's leaving out these things no it, that's what makes it great yeah because it gives somebody this really good starting point point. Mm -hmm. and so um yeah i think that's uh something that i've very much taken in in into mind as i create things is making sure things are accessible yeah and actionable Mm -hmm. A lot of people early on do not want to watch a 20 minute video on how to move. Yeah. They want to move. Mm -hmm. They want to do it. And here's something that I've recognized in myself. And this is a, you can look at it linearly, but it turns into a circle. Um, do, and let's apply this to movement or anything, right? Do it just to do it. Mm -hmm. Do it to get better at it. Do it to get better through it. And then that turns into a cycle where now you're just back to doing it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, you don't have to like evoke meaning out of this stuff all the time and being like, but having gone through different forms of training, I've noticed that there's a period of, I just want to learn how to do this. And then it's like, okay, I got to get better at the technique. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I'm like, oh shit, this is making me a better person. This yeah. is making, like this is making my brain function better. This is making me better at this skill or this skill or this skill. Um, and, and hopefully I can get to the point where I'm not just 
pulling meaning out of it and I can get back to it just being something that allows me to be present in doing the thing. Yeah. And, uh, that's what I've noticed as well in my, um, in my own pursuit is gravitating more towards that beginner level. Yeah. And just like doing it. Well, and like making sure it's something you have fun with, right? Yeah. So like for myself, like all the practices I do, I do enjoy. I like weightlifting. I like doing fucking muscle ups and handstands and animal flow. Like I, I mix up so many different things, right? And like yesterday, like I don't do CrossFit necessarily, mm-hmm. but I do so many things that they do. Like, but I would never say I do CrossFit and I'm at the, like, apparently I found this out at the end of the session. Apparently the ninth best CrossFit gym in the world or something. (laughs) So I was like, I had no idea. And they're like, oh, this is like a big deal. I'm like, oh shit. But one of these two CrossFit dudes who are just animals are like, man, like how long have you been doing CrossFit? And I'm like, I don't do CrossFit. And they're like, (laughs) what? They're like, you're pretty good at this. I'm like, well, I just do movement. And when you under, when you start to understand movement, it just apply like the mechanics are the same across the board. A hip hinge in CrossFit's the same as a hip hinge in powerlifting. The deadlifts might look a little different. We might have different opinions on foot placement, next door rotation versus in, whatever. But you start to understand more of that, and you start to unravel it. And you can unravel it by learning, yeah, twenty patterns first. You learn these twenty basic patterns. Maybe that's the thing you like, or maybe you do like what is it? gymnastic bodies like or yeah. yeah is that what is it i think that's what that's it what is, it's called yeah. yeah and they're like yeah gm gbm or GMB. oh okay yeah gold yeah. Metal, yeah you know what i'm saying global mind body is that it or uh, uh, gmb yeah yeah gymnastic system you know you learn some basic moves you start to learn how to l sit and you start to learn how to like tuck and do a front lever or these different things they all trickle out into each other yeah there's a it's a continuum of movement Anything you learn on the ground, when you understand it intimately enough, applies to something you do when you're hanging, or it applies when you're climbing, or it applies when you're pushing weight. And so all those things, they just carry over and they feed each other. So it's like, don't, like, I had to learn this for myself. And what I would tell someone if I was training them is like, don't get overwhelmed by the volume. Just find the few that you resonate with. We'll work on those. We'll create a level of, you know, mastery there. And then the next time you learned a new one, you're like, oh, this is kind of like that thing. And it like, yeah. it, it just, it just carries over. They just start to feed each other. One thing I have noticed though, as yeah. I progressed as a mover and things start to get more intense. Yeah. Um, is that I can't like, well, we met, we talked about this earlier, but you know, somebody asked me like, how much time do you spend on like moving and fitness on a day? And at the time I was like, I was like, honestly, like altogether, probably like four, five hours a day. Mm-hmm. And I, in that moment, I was like sort of examining myself as well. And I was like, yeah, but I, I honestly want to be doing it less. Yeah. <laughs> because the stuff that I do is more intense or requires yeah. more demand from my body. Uh, so for instance, as I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. Let's just say that's the stage I'm at. But like with, with playing basketball, Mm -hmm. like now when I'm out there and I can dribble with authority, do a spin move, uh, jump stop, yeah, put up a, put up a shot. Like those are intense moves, high impact moves that I'm doing at higher speeds Mm -hmm. and What my body feels like after that, I'm like, with all the other stuff I want to do, I was playing basketball like two, three days a week. I was going down just shooting some hoops. Mm -hmm. Now I got to limit to one day in order to make sure that I still, yeah, I still want to prioritize my strength work. I still want to prioritize the ground movement and developing more skills there. But like, I, I actually have to do less as things start to get more intense. And so that's something to keep in mind is as you start to get stronger, as you start to be able to do things with more skill, those things require more recovery. Yeah. And the volume actually should decrease over time. Mm -hmm. The intensity will increase. I think initially people need a ton of volume yeah, and a ton of volume and it can be very low intensity. 
And that's something I had to learn several times through of like going way too fast into higher mm-hmm. intensity stuff and recognizing my base sucks. My mm-hmm. base to just move my body aerobically and that could be literally in a park, swinging my arms, bouncing up and down mm-hmm. and just moving for like an hour, hour and a half doing random shit like that. I needed to build that base up of just being able to aerobically do that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's where you one needs to recognize they're at. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to say, so... For some people out there, if you tell them you have to do four or five hours of volume in a day, there's definitely people like, I can't, I don't have that much time. Yeah. You know? And so maybe your dedicated practice is 20 minutes, it's an hour, you know, somewhere in that typical workout range, maybe it's two hours. But this is, goes back to the continuum I mentioned, right? Like, we're, we, Grant and I have been practicing movement this whole time. Yeah. Like, in, there's an intention in the way we're sitting, you know, even if we're kind of relaxing, whatever, you can always be doing it. And so it's just like putting that in, like you could, you could argue if somebody has like the, the intention in their movement, it's like, oh yeah, I practice it the entire day. That's very true. Like you know? how, how are yeah. you defining that? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, like, like you're saying there too, and this goes back to, uh, the first two podcasts Sterling and I did, like it doesn't need to be a lot at once. I think it's just more so it could be the mindset with this too, but it's more so just that continuous effort towards yeah. it. Mm-hmm. And it can be in little pockets here and there throughout your day. And then I said this in the last episode, um, do less in a week so you can do more mm. in a month mm. or do less in a month so you can do more in a year. Yeah. Because burnout happens. Yeah. And so uh, it, it rings true for that lower intensity stuff and just continuing to build up that base. And like, you know, um, if you are feeling really out of shape, like recognizing what's required for you to get out of, uh, get out of that spot is going to be a lot of consistent, probably low intensity effort. And then that intensity starts to build up and, and then it's the same thing when you start to get into higher intensity stuff. It's like, do less, Mm -hmm. do less. You can still go on walks. You could still stay active. You could mobilize. You could do some things that are lower intensity, but when it comes to the higher intensity stuff, your body will break down. If you are trying to do way too much, you're trying to, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an energy equation, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times, like people don't have the, uh, a lot of, a lot of people out there aren't, coaches that do this for a living (laughs) like we are and so there's an absolute privilege that we get with that in terms of being able to uh work on this stuff uh, Mm -hmm. a little bit more or have that space uh to work on it a little bit more but it's uh yeah it's interesting um i have one piece for the audience i'd want to add don't also don't if you're just jumping into this for the first time if you're not following someone like Grant who creates like titrated stuff and like you, you'll call it out, hey, this is more beginner level, hey, this is more advanced, right? If you have, there's certain influencers out there that are great people, great movers or athletes, but they'll just put this like, they'll put their program online, like the thing they're doing <laughs> online. Yeah. And then you go and try and do that and you're like, I cannot do this. Yeah. And it's like, well, that person may be a great athlete. They may not necessarily be a great coach. And so their program is more fit for somebody who's already super advanced yeah. and they don't necessarily call it out. Cause I know I've like, I'll buy different coaches programs and stuff for like, or like a membership just to check it out. Cause I like to explore other people's content. I like to explore how they program and then, you know, use myself, my end of one experience doing the program, like how'd that make me feel? And sometimes I'm like, is this actually what you're doing? I'm like, this is hard as fuck, dude. Like, yeah. and then you're like, you're just giving this to like, whoever, you know, and you're asking somebody who just started fitness to do a 95% strength week or whatever. It's like, most people don't even understand what that means. And it's like, you're, we, as individuals, we need to be discerning about the practices we're choosing. And that discernment comes in of like, being honest with yourself to build your confidence, right? And be humble and say like, I'm going to build myself up to this thing. And, and also be okay with the fact that like when you get there in three months, because you, you switched goals, you might lose the thing you built Yeah, and then it'll come back faster again. Exactly. Yeah. You've, so. you've, uh, 
you've grooved that pathway. So yeah, yeah, man, I think that's a good place to, to end. We circled yeah. back to the confidence and, um, you know, it's, uh, use that, use mm. that discernment and trust your own experience and, and your own, uh, the questions that you have, trust, uh, trust that you have the answers through action. Um, and then, um, you know, another thing that I, I'm just continuously working to get better at and something, um, I think everybody should strive for, but specifically if you are a coach or a leader in some, in some way, a guide, uh, is that, that communication, mm -hmm. right? Make that discernment easy for people. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like yeah. You don't have to weed through it or have more questions. Like, can I answer a bunch of their questions and just be like super straight up with what, what, yeah. what we're delivering? So, yep. uh, yeah, with that, uh, some, <laughs> some of the things we asked in this podcast, <laughs> maybe it brought up more questions. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> right? so, <laughs> we'll have to run it back. Run it back. Yeah. If you have any further questions on this podcast, you want us to elaborate on anything, drop them in the comments below. And, uh, other than that, Nate, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, mm -hmm. uh, and being a great example of health and well-being. And, uh, until next time we'll be back. Stay smooth. Thank you.